fork that you use in your kitchen is predominantly female. So you'll always see that there's an F there for the sex, which is a female. It will also go through the age, the fat mills, like how many mills of fat there is between the skin and the meat. And then there's also a whole lot of other information. So we can make this traceable if there's any <coughs> issues that can always be traced right back to the source. So this got slaughtered on the 29th of August. And since then it's been hanging in the fridge. So we're just going to take out the tenderloin fillet. So we just follow it down that back spine. This is probably the easiest part to take out, is it? Pretty easy. Just pull straight out most of the time. That's pretty much it there. You normally just pull that skin straight off. And that's the leanest part of the pork. So I think it's leaner than chicken breast, which I didn't know for a long time. It's like the leanest pig meat that you can get. So that there's your tenderloin fillet. Now I'll start with taking this forequarter off. We normally take the forequarter off between the fourth and the fifth rib. So we essentially just go straight down there. We're going to use the saw because we can do it with a knife. It just takes a little bit of time and it's a bit messy. Go through that joint there. On a band, in a normal butcher shop, we probably take it off on the bandsaw, which takes about one second. It doesn't take as long as this. Yes. Just use a saw from Bunnings or oh. anything like that, right? It's actually a particular meat saw and it's used and designed just for cutting bone. So once you just hear the sawing stop, that's when you know that you're right through the bone. That we can just take straight off like that. And that's your pork four quarter. Um, we've got your pork hock there, we've got the pork meaty riblets that you get in your restaurants as well. We've got the pork collar butt and then the rest of that can go, go into sausages, mince, or you know you do it for a pulled pork or something like that. So the next part that we're going to deal with is just the middle loin part and the belly. There's a joint right here, there's this corner joint. It's always one down from the corner joint. Now this pig's just Obviously, we moved out around a little bit, so that joint's broken a little bit. But that's no problem. I'm gonna get in there. We'll take this part off, which is like the skirt, and we'll pull that back. And we're gonna make that meet up straight up there. cutlets, your pork strip loin, and you also can do loin chops if the pork tenderloin's left on. We'll take the belly off now. So to do that, we normally just mark it straight down there. Just so you're leaving like an even space between that and you're not cutting into any of that meaty loin part. your loin, your rack. If you were to do like a pork rack, we'd normally take that chine bone out so that you can cut in between the bones and portion it singly. 
and then the loin chops, you could cut into chops like that. Today we'll probably bone this one out so we can get that loin steak out and you can do the pork loin steaks and bring. I'll take the pork spare ribs out now. So the pork ribs are e quite easy. I like to leave a little bit of meat on there so that there's something to work with. I don't think there's anything worse than getting some pork ribs with no meat on them at all. And it's probably one of the most expensive part of the pig, it's just the pork ribs, which is, for me as a butcher, I just think it's crazy. Because <laughs> I'm like, it's just bones, right? But people seem to love it. So we'll just go with what the market tells us. And as you can imagine, there's only two real pieces or four pieces of this on a pig. So you can see why it's just so expensive and when everyone wants a pork rib. That's what it's going to be like. Like the supply and demand thing, Exactly right. And even the tenderloin, it's the most tender, the leanest part, and that still gets overlooked in some many ways. You won't really see a pork tenderloin on the menu, but you'll definitely see pork ribs a lot more often. Now there's just a little cartilage here that you can just cut through with a knife. And you've just got some pork ribs. You can go a bit further and take that cartilage part off. That's essentially a pork belly there. Sometimes a little bit of cartilage might get left behind. You might have seen it in the kitchens before. When they're going really fast, a million miles an hour, some little chips tend to get missed. Now this pork's, like, because it's been hanging in the fridge for a little bit, you can tell that the skin gets a little bit harder to work with. It's not as soft. But I'm assuming you take your nipples off probably doesn't present the best on the plate. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what's that? Oh, nothing. It's pork belly, not pork booby, but... <laughs> but yeah, you probably just remove those just for that purpose. This one. Yeah, the top. Pardon? Still the top. Yeah, thank you. So that's your pork belly there, and you, you know, you, you can cut that into your pork belly fingers or whatever you do with that. Some people like to stuff it and roll it as well. We'll go ahead and do this loin of pork now. So we just mark it along that back spine part first. It's just like a lamb, isn't it, with the feather bones? Yeah. yeah. They're essentially very similar, like there's not much difference between a pig and a lamb in bone structure, and even with beef, they're just bigger and smaller animals. The only distinct thing with pork, they have some unusually curved bones, so they don't, lamb doesn't have as many curved bones, but the pork does, which can make it a little bit odd trying to bone it out. Then we'll follow just the rib bones down. And then I'll, I'll cut down off the spare ribs at the end as well, so you've got another lot of spare ribs to work with. So that's essentially, oh yeah, there's that little bit of bone in there too, just breaking off. I might leave it up to one of you to take you this strip bone out if you're game enough. Yeah? Just give you a little bit of practice with your knife, but essentially you just mark it down just this part here and then you could work through that seam in here and you can pull it out. Actually Susie they can do that later. Yeah yeah that's yeah, what just, I mean. Yeah. yeah. So I'll leave that here and then we'll move on to the leg here. So the leg has about four or five different muscle groups in there. Oh. What was that off? No it was just yeah it really is it's, it's, it's top. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So over here, we've got that nice big top side section. You've probably seen it in beef before. It's the biggest muscle in the leg. And then we've got the rump down here. And then over this way, we've got like the knuckle. You might know it as round as well. And we've got the silver side just around the back. Now we've got the trotter as well. You can kind of see where the movement is in the trotter. 
So we normally just mark around the trotter. We just give it a good smash. And that's just the trotter there. <laughs> really gentle. <laughs> now there's this little bit of meat in here that's just on the inside of it. On a on beef, they normally co call that something like a pope's eye. It's not a very common thing. You probably wouldn't see it much, but as I know, it's the only steak that expands and doesn't shrink. Mm. And that just sits on the inside, and it's quite a soft little piece of meat. Now, we've got the tailbone down there, and normally the tail will come out around there. Most of the tails get cut off. I guess, maybe, I don't know if you guys use them. Do you use, ever no. use the tail or cook the tail for any reason? I don't know. Not what, really, no. I don't know what happens to them. We chop them up and goes in the, in the, in the sauce. Mm. Yeah. In the stock. So we just mark around that tailbone. Now, this chump bone's always a very awkward shaped bone. Like, as you can imagine, your hips are, you know, all sorts of different ways. Now there is a little joint in here that's about there. You can go through it. There's not really much point to it, but as the pig gets older, that bone starts to fuse together. So a young pig you can get through, an older pig you wouldn't be able to get through because it's all fused. There's a little cup joint in here where your hip socket would be. Once we get into that joint, it sounds a bit creepy, doesn't it? doing is just trying to free it up all around the bone as I said it's quite an awkward shape so there's a few areas to get into before you can completely free it up so it's starting to come out now Sort of like time restraints per pig or? Um, it depends how the operation is all set up. I really, I haven't touched a knife really other than just the other day for Using about a year. And all that sort yeah. of stuff. Okay. So on a bandsaw you probably have a production line, you'd have two butchers on one side, two butchers on the other. Mm. Essentially the bandsaw operator, yeah. yeah we pretty much cut it into three pieces and throw it at the butchers. Yep. They'd bone do whatever they need to do and then put it down a production line in the middle that would go into another room where it gets cut and packed. So as I said, there's a, it's quite an odd shape there. There's your hip bone, your hip socket, that's where it goes into. So both sides would be universal to each other. And then you can see the bottom of that socket and that's where that kind of sat in there. Now the bone essentially goes down that way but if we cut straight in there, we're probably going to cut that top side in half. So what we try and do is we come around flat on top of it and then go bone it through.
in here we'll find like that little knee cut, kneecap, the patella bone. And there's normally quite a bit of fluid in there, like the synovial fluid that keeps that lubricated so you can you know, walk around. And that's the little kneecap there. Now that's the top side there on that side. Then we'll take out the rest of the bone. There's two bones in this part here, which they sit right on top of each other and there's essentially the tiniest bit of meat in there. So it's not really a hugely important part to get completely clean. And then you'd mark it straight into the hock there where you'd have like your Achilles tendon. And then there's only a very small bit of meat on this side as well. Once that's all opened up, you can kind of see the whole bone there. And then it's just a matter of just pulling it all out. There's that second bone and there's that little piece that I was talking about. And then I'll take out all the different primal areas for you. So we've got the top side just here. Most of the leg gets used for dicing, stir fry or lean mints, or we can bone it and roll it, and of course hams. So that's your top side there. Now we're going to go ahead and just take this knuckle out around and then we've got the rump as well there so we normally just mark that down just that below there so the rumps kept together and this one just has a seam it essentially just rolls out so Round or your knuckle. Also, I guess a lot of places will do a pickled pork leg as well. Now there's this like piece here which is off the hock. It's like a, the gravy beef or you know the gravy of it. It doesn't get used in a whole lot, mostly in casseroles, gets diced or left on like a German knuckle. This is just another seam in there which you're just working your way around that seam. Very similar to the knuckle, it's just a little bit smaller. See the seams there, so nice and neat. It's really hard to. It looks easy, but if you had to do that, it would be pretty it was hard all to open. find. I was like I wouldn't know where to go when it was all open. <laughs> yeah, it looks a bit like a, a little bit yeah. get lost in it. I remember being an apprentice, and I'm like, oh, what yeah. am I doing? <laughs> where am I going? Next, we'll take this rump part off. You can. Some people do like a little rump roast for like a pork or you could do like even lamp like rump steaks but it's not a hugely popular item and then again there's another seam in here this follows down from the silver side
and there's that little gland and that gland normally tells you exactly where the rump starts. And then if you were to slice it that way, they'd look like little rump steaks. Now we've got the silver side and obviously it's got that nice big bit of silver in there and that's why we call it the silver side. Mm. It's also got this little part here like the Jarello or the eye of the round. And I think Bo was saying that they use it for like an imitation of the pork fillet. It's a bit dry and it's a... Uh... It's for the beef, it's called Tafelspitz. Mm. It's an it's a, a Austrian speciality. It's much bigger than, than in, uh, of course, in Paul. But once you trim it up, you can kind of see it's from the resemblance to something like that. Mm. Now, to take this, there's always this little bit of fat that sits between those two muscles. And then to remove this one, you're just marking around it, just like that. Pretty much just doing a bit of an outline. There is a little seam in here between the fat and the muscle. You could cut that up as well. A lot of people, you know, will crumb that as well, so you can cut it into steaks, bash it out and crumb it. Take this little bit of meat off. Guys did with the yeah. lamb shoulder in the lesson two. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. When um, okay. Okay. I, was, I was an apprentice, we used to pin bone. So I don't know if you've ever pin bone before. But essentially, we take stuff out, go through the joint, and it was all just basically to give us those knife skills and fill around the bone. But we used to do it on the beef. We don't really do that anymore, but it's a really good way to get your knife skills up. A lot of practice in that area. Now we're just going to mark down that rib part and come up there, and then we can start pulling it out. You 
go try and let gravity work with you. So if you're just pulling it up, if essentially your knife does less work and you're doing less work. Now we'll take the collar butt out. So the collar butt's that muscle there. We all know that for like pulled pork. And it's like the scotch filling of the pork. It's my favorite piece. There's a seam just in here and that will just come out easily. So pretty much where all the seams are when you're cutting through pretty much places what cut you're going to get and you can pull across the seams. Mm -hmm. Here we've got the pork hock, and like you said, you've done the lamb shoulder before, it's pretty much exactly the same. The only thing with the pork, it's got like a lot more curves in the bone, it's not as straightforward, so that just travels through there and it's your shoulder blade. First thing we'll do is we'll mark around the pork hock. We'll just find the bone here, we'll follow that down. from the skin so they'll you know put a probe in it and that'll tell us. Is there a certain point on the feet that you can take that test from? Um, yeah I think it's normally from the rump because that's where the, most of the fat is. So that bone now is completely exposed and well, we can go ahead and start taking that out. There's that cut joint in the middle there. You can just cut straight through. And again, just letting gravity work with you. So you're just holding it and moving the knife around. And then that's a pork cock. Now we've just got that last piece and this is the awkward shaped bone. How 
long did it take you to perfect this? Um, For like you really have it. I'm within your apprenticeship normally, so by six six to twelve months I was pretty much boning um, everything. And then probably after about 12 months, you can start on a bounce or mm -hmm. that type of thing. Yeah, but yeah, bounce, huh? most of it, I mean, best place to learn is always a private butcher shop, yeah. but the apprenticeships are almost non-existent these oh, days, yeah. which is a little bit sad to see. Yeah. And you're seeing a lot of, you know, trained knife hands and skilled workers, and also a lot of people taking it into the kitchens as well. Is there places that will only take qualified butchers instead of those butchers that are um, do a, it but don't? There's a pay difference, definitely. Okay, okay. But then again, there's a lot of very skilled knife hands out there yes. that can probably put a lot of yeah. other, you know, qualified butchers to shape. So in here, you know, you've got your blade, you've got your chuck as well, but it's, essentially it doesn't get put into primals or anything. Most of this gets boned and rolled, put into mints, diced, all that type of stuff.